simply put, it's DNA from cells that are released by an organism into soil, plants, or water. All living things have DNA and they all continuously release it from their skin, their body hair or fur, scales, saliva, or down the intestinal tract. So fish in waterways would be releasing urea and scales. Frogs can release cells when they're going through a metamorphosis. And birds will leave bird droppings and feathers. The science of environmental DNA, or eDNA, describes how we can collect or extract DNA from the environment without even physically observing or handling the organism. So previously, you would have to find scat, blood, hair, feathers to, to get that DNA. Um, now it's easier and cheaper to collect eDNA from water or from sediments. It's a major advancement because we don't have to first confirm that the organism is present or even in the vicinity when you're sampling. And you can get samples uh, through trained lay persons. You don't have to have a species-specific expert out there. So, for example, from a cup of water collected out of a pond, you can collect DNA evidence from uh, aquatic species that are in the environment or have passed through or terrestrial animals that have used that water body. So it's a very powerful and sensitive monitoring tool. Because it's such a sensitive monitoring tool, eDNA works really well when you're trying to find a rare or hard to find organism. And generally it's used to detect a single species, but, but now scientists are sampling entire communities using eDNA and the methods. It also works well when you're trying to determine the, the current or historic distribution of an organism across a wide expanse and can potentially save a lot of money and effort in doing so. So we're going to cover what is being collected and then what is the origin um, of that eDNA. So basically, um, all organisms, whether they're in a terrestrial environment or an aquatic environment or even flying through the air, they leave a trace of DNA in that environment. Um, and so we can sort of think about this environmental DNA as like DNA forensics. So if you had committed a crime, right, they would sweep the room for a trace of that particular person or so on, or they would look for things left behind. Um, and that's basically what our goal is when we're um, looking for a trace of an organism with environmental DNA. And the advantage to this and using an environmental DNA is that we can detect an organism without direct contact. So we don't actually have to come in contact with whatever our target species is. So the DNA that's left behind that we're specifically looking for can be free DNA, meaning it's no longer bound in a cell. It can be cellular DNA, um, like nuclear DNA, or it could be organelle DNA, like mitochondrial DNA or chloroplast DNA. These are two organelles that we find in a cell. Um, and those are traces of these organisms that are left behind as they move through an environment. And these can be from things like scales and slime. So that would be like a fish. And um, it can be from feces or urine, certainly from gametes when organisms are spawning, particularly in, in um, aquatic habitats, but also in other habitats. Um, they can come from remnants of an organism, um, like a fish carcass left behind or a carcass of another organism left behind. They can also come from blood or from saliva of an organism. So basically any kind of trace of that organism as it moves through that particular environment as it's left behind. And I should say that that organism only leaves a trace if it moves through that particular environment and it's been there on a relatively recent scale. But basically, just like if you were sampling traditionally, for an organism, you wouldn't see, if you didn't tr traditionally sample that organism with a net or a mist net or whatever it is, you wouldn't say that that organism didn't exist in that particular environment. Um, you would just say that at that particular time when it was collected, you didn't find it. So what's being collected then is this DNA that's shed by the organism into the environment. And it is a complex mixture of nuclear mitochondrial DNA. Um, and you can see in this little drop here of water that there's metabolic waste, there's damaged tissue, there's skin cells, scales, and free DNA. And all of those things exist in an aquatic habitat and even in a terrestrial habitat. So it can be intracellular or free DNA. Um, if we're thinking about aquatic habitats, we might be thinking about freshwater habitats, saltwater habitats. 
or even terrestrial species that use a water habitat. So maybe like a drinking ground, a pond that they come to to drink from, or like in the case of a salamander where they might use an ephemeral pond, a pond that's there for a short period of time, um, but then they lay their eggs and then they move on from that particular water. Or we can think about um, from a terrestrial environment, something like soil or air, bark or guano, bark chewing. So there's a, re a paper that came out not that long ago where there were some, um, I believe, ungulates and primates that like chewed on bark and they detected who they were from saliva, watering holes, and then even blood samples from ticks um, or other insects have been used as well. So it's basically any kind of DNA that's in that particular environment from an aquatic or terrestrial mm -hmm. habitat. So the whole purpose then is to collect this trace of an organism that's been left behind to concentrate the DNA, then to extract the DNA using DNA extraction methods to amplify it with some kind of primer method, um, whether you're going to do a species specific tool or you're going to use like take attendance and do a meta barcoding tool. And then ultimately your goal is for detection. And so you're trying to detect that trace of an organism that's been left behind through that particular environment. And this is a figure from a paper called Environmental DNA and more an emerging tool in conservation for monitoring past and present biodiversity. And you can see they've done a variety of different types of organisms that have been that they show that have been identified from aquatic, different aquatic samples. So types of samples that have been worked on, freshwater samples, we've done a lot of work in my lab with some freshwater river samples, seawater samples, this is sort of um, a cornerstone paper, Yamamoto et al., where they did a survey and they did some meta barcoding. So they compared one environmental DNA survey to 14 years and they had great detectability. There's been detection of, of terrestrial species from water samples, mammals from water samples, and then even from snow in terms of looking for wolves and Boxes. Other types of samples include like ice cores, air and pollen samples for insects and bees, soil samples. That's sort of where eDNA originally got its start was in soil and microbial samples. And then it's, of course, taken off from here. Blood meal, whether that's from ticks or other organisms, graze substrates, and then even fecal samples. And that's sort of a, a baseline of eDNA as well. So um, we target small fragments, and people always ask the question, but we target small fragments because even small fragments of DNA, like 100 base pairs to 150 base pairs, which is usually where we target for DNA, they degrade beyond detectability within a few days, particularly in aquatic habitats like seawater samples, which is where I spend a lot of my time working. So you can say then relatively recently that that organism was in that particular habitat. Um, now, it's not quite the same for other samples in soil and, and things like that. DNA works very different, but in an aquatic habitat, within just a few days, then these small DNA fragments de degrade beyond detectability. So in just in the same way, if you were doing traditional sampling, you could say that that organism um, had been there when you were there. You can also do that with environmental DNA. Um, and then there are many things that impact um, how the DNA persists in an ecosystem. And I just wanted to sort of give you a little start to this. But there are lots of environmental factors that impact and change the way um, DNA degrades or persists in an ecosystem. Everything from light and temperature to time um, when thinking about microbes and enzymes. And this figure illustrates in an aquatic ecosystem, but the same is true for sediments or ice cores or pollen samples. They all have completely different scenarios in terms of the way that they persist. And so the thing to really remember with this is that it's very habitat and ecosystem specific in terms of what you're going to work on in, in terms of how long that DNA that you intend to collect, that you want to collect that trace of that organism can be left behind.